Hello? Is that better? Hi. Uh, welcome to today's session on uh, open data for good. Uh, it's obviously a topic very close to um, what I do at the local. Um, so what is open data? In my kind of view, open data is any kind of data set that otherwise would be hidden away in the vaults of an organization, whether it's digital or analog. And we really saw at the local the importance of open data during the pandemic. So if you were uh, aware that there were deaths in long-term care homes in huge numbers, that was open data. If you were getting data every day on how many infections there were in the city, in the neighborhood, that's all open data. So it's had a profound impact. Um, during the pandemic, and at least for the local, it's been a huge aspect of how we report on urban health and social issues uh, in the city. So we're gonna talk a bit about that today. And so we have three amazing uh, speakers on the panel here, and I'll introduce them in order, and they each have like seven minutes, short presentation, and then we'll open it up for hopefully some interesting discussion. So um, to my left here is Denis Carr. Hey, Denis. Uh, Denis is the supervisor of the City of Toronto's Open Data Program and has been a part of exciting efforts to modernize government through digital transformation for over a decade. Denise's team, uh, alongside with Open North, delivered the city's first open data uh, master plan, which sets the strategic direction for open data at the City of Toronto. So please join me in a round of applause. Welcome to Denis. And at the center of the stage, uh, we have Joseph Lalonde, who is data and analytics manager at the Toronto Public Library. His, departmental support, uh, his department supports TPL's data-informed decision-making focus area of the 2020 to 2024 TPL digital strategy. Prior to joining TPL, Joseph was at Mars Discovery District where he drove insights into the startup innovation and clean tech ecosystem in Canada. He has a master's of business administration from the Schulich School of Business at York University. Welcome, Joseph. <laughs> and last but not least is Xavier Richet V. Uh, this, this, yeah. It's all Francophone here, right, you guys? <laughs> you guys should just do this in French and I'll just <laughs> leave. Um, so uh, Xavier Richet Viz is a Toronto-based investigative journalist and newsroom coder with the Investigative Journalism Foundation. At the IJF, he covers all things data. In the absence of accessible open source data, he uses computational methods like web scraping, which he'll talk about today, and natural language processing to create his own data sets. He also writes the IJF's weekly lobby roundup newsletter, which covers lobby, lobbying across Canada. Prior to joining the, the IG, IJF, he was a communication and data consultant with the World Health Organization's Health Emergencies Program. So welcome, Xavier. <laughs> All right, enough from me. I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Denis to uh, give us a glimpse into what the city has been doing. Hi, everybody. You wanna nice switch to seats? So yeah, go in the hot seat, nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, Seven minutes, Not, there's, there's too much to talk about. Uh, but first, uh, uh, I've been really lucky to be part of the open data movement in Toronto, uh, that the city of Toronto, since 2009, that's when the program first started. So that's 14 years. Uh, didn't always look like this. This is the current open data portal. Has any, put your hand up if you've gone to this website. City's Open Data Portal. Oh, that's pretty good, that's pretty good. Um, were you looking up transportation data? Put up your hand. All right, um, there's a lot of different categorizations of data that we've been trying to move towards. So early on in the program, it was a lot about what could be released, you know, more of a, um, what's talked about as the first phase of open data or the first wave of open data, more like a FOI kind of model, like freedom of information or request would come. Uh, then we see like more of a phase two where there was a little Sorry, a little bit more along the lines of um, 
you know, what can be pulled. So open by default, open by design, the city should be open by design. And the third stage we were looking at is not just what the city produces, but what could be come from the community, uh, what could come from private groups and how we might be putting them together. Uh, in 14 years, a lot has happened. Uh, there, in the last little bit, we focused a lot around foundational technology and how do we evolve the program. When it first started, you can imagine as like a request for data, there might not be a central system where it's located in. Uh, it might be an Excel file on somebody's desktop. They email it to us and then we post it like a bulletin board with open data sets on it. There's a lot of utility in that, but as a catalog grows and grows, it becomes harder and harder to keep the data fresh, relevant, uh, to increase the size, the amount that you produce. And we focused a lot on technology to be able to do create data pipelines, so to connect to source systems and then release the data that way. Um, there is still a lot to be done. There is a lot of data on the city's website that might exist in a map or an app that we don't um, necessarily publish through the catalog. And that's a lot of internal processes within the city that we're looking to, uh, you know, so if there is a, an approval process to get a, uh, an application published on the city's website, how might we uh, augment our own processes so that we can release the data on the open data portal at the same time? At a very minimum, we should be at least be publishing what is currently available on the city's website. And you'll see that there was a recent council motion a few years ago to do just that, to give us carte blanche, to be able to publish that kind of data. Uh, like what Ty was saying is also very relevant in, we've seen a lot of change in how the nature of our data, um, the expectation around it since the pandemic. And it's interesting in watching and helping run the program internally. To release data within the city, we have something called an approval to publish process. So it's very important because privacy is very important within data uh, and full reviews of a data set before it goes live to the public. So there's a series of checks and balances connecting with the people who own the data, the system that it's in, figuring out a way to publish it onto the data portal and make sure it's as accurate and most up to date as possible. Now what's interesting in the pandemic was um, the expectation that we release the data immediately so that it not be perfect be okay, um, and that the understanding that the data would be refined over time. Now that's interesting to think about it outside of the pandemic and apply that model now. For us to go to groups within the city to say, release the data as it is, we understand that there might be a level of like refinement that still needs to be happen, or maybe it's continuously being improved, but there's an ex expectation that we should be able to release stuff as it becomes available. Um, Building greater capacity for ourselves to be able to publish data is really helping us scale up. So in the first years of the open data program, it was something like 20 to 30 data sets being released a year. Uh, we're hoping to be able to do more of like in the hundreds of year. And in what we're starting to see for the first time is we always, what's difficult with an open data portal is you don't really know who's using the data. Uh, part of our license says you don't have to tell us. You, the data is free for you to use. You could use it commercially. Uh, but we're starting to see more of a pattern of a reliance heavily on the data. So if you have an app in your phone, like for the TTC, next arrival data, um, you know, that's coming off of the, you know, the portal we host or another data set like that. Uh, if there's a disruption in it, it automatically affects your application or whatever you're doing. And what we're seeing is, uh, like for instance, something like the city licenses short-term rentals, like Airbnb. And what we do on our open data set is we release the listing that municipal license and standards has of everyone who's registered to have it. So there's a registration number. And then private companies like Airbnb and bookings.com will look at that data set to see, is this a legitimate rental? Like is this somebody who's licensed? So you can think that's a little bit different than our model in the past of here's some data, please do what you like. You know, there's no guarantee that it'll be necessarily refreshed on a regular basis. A data set like that, that there's some business reliance on, um, has to be up constantly, has to be released daily. One of the challenges uh, that I think we're starting to see in the space around open data that, you know, I've come through a couple of times recently is um, 
you know, especially with the movement toward analytics and machine learning around data, in those models, there's a lot of work towards the st statistical significance or statistical relevance in the data. And what we want to make sure is the data that we release is carries the diversity within the data as much as possible. Okay, let me break that down into real terms. Is we want to make sure that um, there's representation in data as much as possible. So if we release a data set, there is privacy uh, considerations that need to be taken into place that it's not, uh, doesn't identify an individual in some cases or can't be used to de-anonymize uh, with, with another data set to show, uh, reveal a private individual. So in some cases, important groups like transgender um, or others will be grouped up into a category of other because there is not enough count in the data for it not to be um, easily de-anonymized. That's a challenge for us because we want the data to be as diverse as possible. And we're working with our data for equity groups to think about the, the interplay of privacy and equity in releasing a data. There's no really easy solution for that from an open data perspective. Internally, it's a very different story. Data can be shared internally in certain ways, or the analytics on it can be done in the kind of a black box environment so that the, those privacy considerations don't come into place. But that area is, is an interesting one for us as we start to explore. The other is there's, a, this may be the last point before we break off into others, is um, you know, there's one thing about releasing data from the city, so the city sides, from, from its agencies, transactional data maybe, uh, but we've seen a real growth in data from the community. And, um, oh yeah, there were slides. <laughs> this is just some examples of data that we release in that kind of case where somebody builds something else upon it. So we see the Toronto Star uses dine safe data, which is restaurant inspections, to automatically create articles. Nobody's writing this article. The op it's published by their open data team that looks at the feed of our dine safe open data and then cre can create a news article and sometimes it could be like um, isolated to your geographic spot. And then maybe the next slide. Nice, thanks. Um, we're trying to do two things, really. Promote community use of open data and how it's being used and publish those articles on our open data portal. So there's one thing of us talking about in the city about the data that we have, but others utilizing data and how they might do it. But the really important thing here is also what's not great about the data set? What's missing from it? What made it difficult to use? Uh, and so that we can learn to make it more accessible. We're really looking into how we can, um, particularly in the second example about uh, data about noise in the city, is the city captures data in a particular way in some elements, but community source data sets. So individual sensors that people have or um, data that they've collected, how might we best augment the data that we have on the open data catalog to include that? And even maybe private data too, so that, that movement to, to beyond just what the city has, but to our other partners. And maybe I'll pause it there. Thanks, Denny. Uh, we'll talk more about the city's open data uh, once we get to the Q&A portion. So next, we're going to have Joseph talk about TPL's approach to open data. Great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and so uh, as mentioned, I'm the manager of data and analytics at the Toronto Public Library. And uh, But before I get into the library perspective, I'd just like to sort of um, tell you a little bit about uh, prior to the library, uh, when I was at Mars Discovery District, it was sort of right at the, the adoption curve of when uh, a lot of governments and a lot of other organizations were getting on the, the sort of the open data train. Um, and there's starting to be a lot of excitement about it. And, um, you know, interestingly, because Mars, you know, scales uh, startups and helps businesses grow, there's businesses who would come to us and they'd say, how can I, you know, take open data and turn it into some kind of a business model? So that was kind of a really interesting thing. And, you know, one of those businesses actually turned into one that's, you know, still going and still in Toronto, um, and they're called Think Data Works. And so they're, 
they're kind of, you know, they're still doing some really neat stuff. So, you know, I encourage everybody to kind of check them out. So that was just a bit of a segue into sort of, you know, my first taste of, of open data from, um, you know, from a, a, a adoption perspective. So um, just getting onto the library, so calling your attention to this slide up here, um, I'm sure you can kind of agree that right up at the top left, it says, you know, on a typical day at TPL, there's a lot going on. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just, you know, in one day across the library system, um, you know, you can see, you know, 25,000 uses of our technology. Uh, we have 100,000 people visiting the library and, and so on and so forth. And just, you know, I'll maybe cap this off with a couple of other statistics. Um, you know, in 2022, uh, we had almost uh, 10 million visitors to our, our branches. Nearly 27 million items were uh, in circulation. So that's uh, both electronic circulation, like e-books, e-audiobooks, as well as, uh, you know, physical items. Um, and then in terms of the number of programs, so programs could be something like this, but it could also be kids' programs or seniors' programs. You know, we had 19,000 of those with, you know, 350,000 attendees. So if you sort of contrast that with the fact that um, we actually were hamstrung, we're at the beginning of 2022 for nearly the first quarter, we had 41 branches closed. So you can just imagine, you know, the amount of activity if we have all the branches open all year. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens with 2023. So you say, okay, well, that's, that's great. You guys have got a lot of data. You probably can do some really amazing stuff with it. So, and we do do some amazing stuff with it. My, my team is amazing and, you know, I'm really thankful for them. But then it's always the question of how can we do more with the data we've got? Because we've almost got too much. So I think for the people here, sort of like in the community and in the know, well, it's, it's actually kind of an obvious answer, right? You, you uh, groom your data to be fit for use and you release it so that people can actually, you know, drive other insights around it. Um, so that's kind of one challenge we have is we have staff, but again, how do we do more? It's that scale question. So, um, and then what could we do with open data? So here are some of, you know, sort of a wish list or some, you know, um, ideas of the types of things that could be done with, you know, library open data sets. And when you contrast that with other open data sets, like for example, from other city services. Um, you could have things like, um, you know, recognizing that the demographics of Toronto are changing. So uh, how do you, you know, curate uh, our services in a sort of a proactive way as well as our collections, our programs, recognizing the changing demographics of the city and become more predictive and proactive about it. Um, related to that, there's changes in media consumption habits. So, you know, with the pandemic, our electronic services, of course, got this huge shot in the arm, and our physical services, not so much, and now things are starting to balance back out. But what, what is that going to look like with people's new kind of viewing habits that they might have? Um, another, uh, on the much more serious side, is like incidents. Um, so incidents are no joke. The serious uh, security or otherwise, you know, how do we... Um, use data to better protect our customers and staff. So that's another, another use. And then another one is around demonstrating impact. Um, how can the library show that, you know, it's having an impact on the community and what are the opportunities for, you know, demonstrating that through data? So those are just some, you know, things that we would like to do. And so speaking of doing things better, so I have a few, I have a few announcements that I think will probably be of interest. One is that um, our, the, the, the library's open data portal didn't really get much of a refresh during the pandemic due to, you know, operational constraints and a number of other factors. So we're kind of taking a, a, a slightly new direction. Um, and we have actually have some people from the project team here, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, so what we're going to be doing is we're, we're re-releasing a lot of the data to make it more fit for use. Um, we're going to be creating a roadmap where it gets more granular over time um, while still respecting privacy. So that granularity will allow people to be able to, um, you know, do a better job of analysis. And then, you know, the last big change is that we're actually going to be moving it off of our platform 
and we're going to be uh, moving our open data onto the city's wonderful platform that's very mature and uh, will highlight the fact that you can actually like cross-reference you know, library data with other kinds of data that you see on the city to be able to draw those insights. So we're really, really excited for that. We actually have a launch in, in uh, July, so in a few weeks. Um, but that will just be the beginning and we're gonna be releasing more and more data over time there. So really, you know, keep an eye on the city's portal because that's where it's gonna be. Um, I will say, I'll also add though, is we're gonna have our own portal that it won't have data on it, but it'll have all sorts of resources. It'll talk about open data programs and events, uh, just like this one. It's gonna talk about how to get started with open data. Um, you know, things from our collection that you can reference. So keep an eye on that, but also keep an eye on our open data portal because it's gonna be, it's gonna be all the stuff in there that surrounds just the data sets. Um, so you'll be able to get this real 360 view if you wanna like get into open data or grow your open data skills. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, pass the floor over to Xavier. Joseph? Um, can you maybe just highlight for us what are some of the data sets available through TPLs? Sure. Um, so this, this uh, first release is going to be around our circulation. Um, it's going to be in branch visits. Um, there's, we have, you can see here we have a number of public computers. So there's you know, workstation, workstation usage. Um, there is going to be some data around our programs. Um, and uh, then we're going to be, like I said, we're going to be making those more granular. Um, and then we're going to be uh, adding more data sets over time. And that will probably be a reflection of, you know, the feedback that we get from the community. Um, and, or as data is, is ready. So, um, like I said, we've got lots and lots of it. So, it's just, it's almost a question of what, what, what comes first. Um, oh, yes. And then the other data set that's very important is it's going to be branch characteristics. So does a branch, like not just locations, but does a branch have like a digital innovation hub? Does it have a fabrication studio? Does it, you know, uh, there's gonna be things around uh, seating and uh, capacity and square footage. So it's gonna be uh, all that kind of like reference data, master data, and then it'll be coupled with like 10 years of like transactional data that you can link to it. Cool, thanks Joseph. Okay, last but not least, Xavier. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Xavier. I'm an investigative reporter of the Investigative Journalism Foundation. Um, I think I've been brought in here today to talk maybe about some of the realities of open data, though. Um, and I think I just want to first start off by saying um, that open data is one of the most massively important data things that is currently existing in Canada because it's one of the easiest ways to get data that you can use in your journalism. Um, right now, I myself am working uh, on a story that involves uh, Toronto police open data, um, data that was really, really hardly fought for. Um, in order to have police officers actually record, you know, some of their race-based data, for example. So, very important initiative, but like I said, sometimes there are certain political realities around it. Um, but first, let me talk to you a little bit about the Investigative Journalism Foundation. So, we maintain a number of different databases around political donations, lobbying, charity tax returns, in the future we'll have financial disclosures, that's a big one, and in order to get this data, we do something called web scraping of different registries of lobbyists. So this is an example. This is the federal registry of lobbyists. So at the top, you'll see the federal, the official lobbying registration, the in-house one, for the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. So every day, we have little programs that go in, and they take all the little individual data points that you can see up there in terms of their communications with federal officials. And as a result of that, we can take that data and then we can do really interesting stories with it. So this is an example of a story I did that was basically tracking uh, lobbying communications by environmentalists and oil gas lobbyists. And we found that uh, big oil lobbyists obviously just met with the government just so much more. And more important than that, they were meeting with certain key people a lot more. So for example, if you look at the charts, Environmentalists, really easy to meet with Environment Canada. Just like super easy, more than oil and gas. That makes a lot of sense. 
But if you're an environmentalist and you want to meet with Natural Resources Canada, you want to meet with Finance Canada, like these big, organiz these big organizations, sorry, agencies, that hold a lot of power in terms of regulation, in terms of access to the Prime Minister's office, it's a lot harder. Now, why I'm telling you all this? So this is a data set that's actually available as an open data set. You can go and you can go see it. But the reality is it doesn't have everything. It has a lot of things and it doesn't have every individual point. So as part of our web scraping efforts, we maintain that data and you can go and see it online and you can have it. It's a very easy search interface. You can go and you can see it. Um, but this is very national. So how about we just bring it down to maybe a local level? Next slide, please. So this is a story that was done by Inori Roy at the local uh, a couple years ago. Um, I built a scraper to track um, an open data set. I think it's fair to call it an open data set that was held by the uh, Ontario Ministry of Education. This is what it used to look like. Note that I say used to. So you could go and you could uh, go and see every single class size for um, I think like 2005 to 2016 or something and every single class size in Ontario and you could see as a parent what what are the, what's the environment my children is in and what, what like are they getting enough access to their teachers and it was a really useful tool and it wasn't Alfred as, as a data set per se but I do believe it's fair to call it open data um, and as part of the story uh, you know, we wanted to look at what was happening in terms of not the class sizes per se, but in terms of classrooms that were dual grades, which means there's two grades in a classroom and they can, and they work alongside each other, but maybe they're not getting the most attention from their teachers. So we built a scraper. That's what a scraper looks like. This is Python for all the nerds out there. Uh, and we went through and we just collected all of the data. And the story was written, uh, it was a great story. I definitely recommend you go see it. It's really about just the state of your Toronto schools. And a week later, that's what the data, that's what the URL was returning. And it is still returning this to this day. You can go and you, it's error 404, this file doesn't exist. So this is from Internet Archive. This is what it looked like a week before the, scra the, the scraper ran. And then that's a week after the scraper was run. So I'm not a lawyer, so I'm going to choose my words very carefully here. But this is my feeling. It feels like this open data set was very advantageous. You know, this wasn't run by the Ford government, but this was a data set that was, you know, that was maintained under archival and research purposes, as it's written on the site, um, and was very useful for a site. They stopped updating it after the Ford government came, came to power and was just left up there and the moment it became not useful in the way it was imagined, which isn't the point of open data, it's like, as our wonderful speakers have said, it's meant to be used in whichever way you choose to use it uh, for the public good. I wonder why it was taken down. And that's a very real political reality of data. And I'm sure you'll see lots of other examples where open data has talked about where they've seen a similar reality. So that's a very local example. So. What I think is really interesting about web scraping as a technique by organizations like the press is it gives us a place to collect this data and maintain it in a way that other people can use it if it's not 100% clear if it will stay up there. So maybe we can go on to the next slide. And you know, with web scraping and collecting all of this data, we can also do other interesting things with it. We can take it one step further. So every week, as I, as I was mentioned, I write uh, a lobbying newsletter. Um, there's the Federal Registry that we spoke about briefly, but our, our scrapers also run for all of the provincial ones, all the provincial lobbying registrations, and which aren't maintained as open data sets. So it's a better view of everything that's happening in lobbying in Canada. And we have incredible developers at the IJF who are creating all of these web-based tools to go through the data and make it really easy for me to go and read every single updated lobbying registry in the country. So for example, this was last week's lobbying newsletter. The headline reads, uh, Constable's lobbying towards 
uh, to water down law, making it easier to suspend police without pay. The way I found that is a super, super easy little tag in our database that says this is the first version of the registration. Maybe I should go read it. Maybe there's something interesting in there. Another interesting tool that we have, it's called the diff tool. I don't know whether it stands for difference or differentiation. You'll have to take it up with a developer. Um, but it showed me that two key people at AstraZeneca Canada changed their titles and had different portfolios. So for example, and both of them featured the word pricing. And you go, oh, that's kind of interesting. Okay, what's happening at Astra AstraZeneca Canada in terms of pricing? And then you can go and find out that there's a lot of context to it that maybe you haven't seen in the news. And you can go and you can, and you can go and you can go and read it and you can just put it within context and there you go, there's a story. Um, so there's an example on the left of one that isn't maintained as an open data set and then on the right, one that is maintained as an open data set and all around is interesting stories for us to report on. Um, and I think I'll just end very briefly by saying that, um, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, more advancements in open data are absolutely necessary and they're very, very important because certain government bodies are the only people who are ever gonna be trusted with maintaining those data sets. And that's a very, very, very fair point and we should keep pushing them to do so. But when it comes to, but at the same time should probably exist something on the side in terms of the press, maybe our organization, maybe others, there's other incredible organizations that are doing great work with data, the local for example. Um, yeah, and I think this is just the landscape as it should exist. Thank you so much. Sorry, we have to switch seats there. Um, yeah, so now we have 20 minutes left. Um, we can totally open it up. Um, we had obviously three different vantage points on data, the city, the library, and from a journalist standpoint. Um, I mean, it got me thinking a lot as I heard you speak um, just about like who decides what is open data and how is that decided? and. Um, I mean, in instances where open data isn't available, then obviously we've got people like Xavier who are scraping websites in order to create the data sets that they so desire. So maybe my question is more directed to Denis and, and uh, Joseph there. How is that process decided? I mean, you've got tons of data on the city's website, but what is that? Like, who decides what data set gets to be public? Yeah, yeah it's a good question. Um, and there's a couple of different ways to think about it. So one I might just put on the hat of like whenever we're thinking of, do we have a prioritization framework? So we get a lot of requests for data. There'll be requests like from the public. Um, I can think about it this way. There'll be requests from city council. So city council will pass a directive or a motion to release a particular data set. And we've seen this happen a lot. And there might be particular elements of the data that'll be requested as well. So, you know, uh, Toronto bike share ridership was one. Uh, where the stations are, where the, uh, you know, individual usage patterns of it, um, every, uh, down to granular detail of it. Um, there'll be, uh, you know, death in the homeless population or pe people experiencing homelessness, both in the shelter system and uh, overall. And you'll see that was a recent council motion to come back to see how we might increase the frequency of the release of that data um, and also enrich it to you know, uh, more details around it. We get data requests internally. So there'll be instances of a group of being like, hey, we're running this program. We want to the release the data. You know, there's a, it's the more than just proactive disclosure. There's like a rationale to release it. We'll also see data released for um, efficiency inside the city for a business process. So they'll be like, look, we get requests for this data a lot of times, and um, you know, if we release it through you once, it makes business sense to us. And to be honest, that's one of the top reasons we put in a business case to give us more money and resources. It's the easiest one. Say, look at the efficiency that we can cause. Um, others will be, a data set is being released in some capacity, like on the web, that could be scraped, uh, but let's release it in tandem uh, on the open data portal. So for instance, the city will release an update to its zoning bylaws, but at the same time we connect with the zoning bylaw team to be like, let's release it in a machine readable format as well. Uh, 
we often, like every single day, we'll get a number of requests from the public around data sets. What's interesting, though, is sometimes there's a bit of a tipping point where there's, is it a new data set request or is it an enhancement of a data set or expansion of a data set? Um, and, or like, it hasn't been updated in a while. Can you please go back and check on it? Uh, so I think there's a balance of those. And if we're going to rank them in priority, it's like if it came from city council, it's something we have to do and probably pretty fast. Um, if there's uh, a win-win scenario because the data is being released already and so a pipeline is being created, you know, so it's going to be there's an, a map that's going to be made or an app that's going to be made, we're going to go for it. Um, and then if there's a hot button issue, so it's in the media or it's being talked about politically, we'll push more action towards it. And a recent one that kind of fits in that sphere is uh, park bathrooms and uh, water fountains. So where are they? But also now you'll see the increase of it is like, are they open or closed on their schedule? But also, are they closed because there's maintenance or something involved with it? So I guess that's a little bit on the, uh, what we release in the hierarchy of it. Um, just the last point of it is from a um, data-informed decision-making within the city, we had two recent council motions pop up. One that says um, internally, look, we have to have some kind of standardization around um, how we release the data. So for an FOI process, it's 30 days. Like there's a particular legislative timeline that has to be met. Should we have something similar for open data? So we're about to investigate that. The second one, which is really interesting, it's in this puzzle of how we might be able to implement it, is council passed a motion that said, look, we write a lot of staff reports at the city, and they go to a whole bunch of committees, and then they go up to city council, and decisions are made on that. The agenda goes live a week before, and sometimes you can see those staff reports. That gives you a bit of time to read it over and then be able to like make a, you know, maybe a deputation to city council or get involved participation-wise in the city process. Um, we saw a request come in for us to, be, to say, look, if one of those reports is being created and there's data involved in the decision around it, we should be releasing that data as open data and as proactively as possible. I think about something like that of like city budget data. We got to release that way earlier so there's a lot more time to look at it before those decisions are being made. So something really exciting for us, it's an opportunity to do a lot of engagement internally around open data, but also to bring the importance of this data being released that is informed for data decision making way earlier uh, and the stewards of the people who are involved or they're in the like the day to day of writing those reports or using that data into our process of open data. So that's a, a bit of an exciting thing coming. Joseph, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, we have a slightly, obviously a different perspective because we're almost like the supplier of the, the data. And, and I mean, I think, you know, the point where we're at right now is there's, um, you know, certain um, data sets or data points that we, that we, you know, speak about all the time when we're telling the library's story. So, uh, so I think, you know, those are some of the ones that I had, I had mentioned earlier, and those are some of the ones that you would have seen on the slides. And, you know, the decision that we made sort of as a project team when we we're like revamping and rethinking what our open data would look like is that we um, would focus, uh, instead of on quantity, we'd sort of focus on quality and we'd take it slow. Um, so, you know, for now, it's, it's almost like what you would see now on our open data portal that's grandfathered in, but we're revamping it. And then once we get those really like right, then you know we'll release other other sets. And I think the decision making process there will be, you know, uh, is it in good enough shape to release? Like, is it you know really fit for use? And uh, is it uh, meet you know any kind of privacy requirements? And then uh, the other thing will be like you know demand by by the community. So that's. So, you know, we want to hear from you uh, if there's, you know, certain things or certain stories that you want to tell that you think, you know, a library data set would round it out. Um, and then we could, you know, make a point of looking at uh, uh, releasing it then. So, so we're kind of in a good place right now because the, the world is our oyster. But uh, for now, we're just going to kind of, like I said, grandfather things in and just like do it better. Related to that, Xavier, um, you must see all kinds of open data across the country, like who are some of the good 
shops for open data versus the ones that frustrate the heck the heck out of you because they don't release anything. Like, do you have any any thoughts on that? Well, I I do think that uh, a lot of Toronto bodies release data really really well, right? Because and they they're very good about sharing data sets from different Toronto organizations. For example, you know you can find all of the Toronto police uh, data on. TPL site, sorry, not TPL site, uh, the, Toronto, the city of Toronto site. And so they just do a really great job of communicating with each other in order to be able to just make that, ev make sure that everybody can find that data and it's not very difficult. There's a very good search interface, which is just like absolutely needed and more in other places. Um, uh, alternatively, um, one of the biggest actors is Open Government Canada, where you can go and just see all kinds of open data sets um, for just like any topic you can think of in terms those are some of the those are some of the really good ones I feel like yeah search and have really good search interfaces make it just give as much as possible you know they have great data dictionaries that just you can just see what everything is you can access it ex you can access it um, from the command line you can just as a developer you can just like pull the data as opposed to having just downloaded data like a Excel spreadsheet every time so all around really great work from Toronto um, yeah that's what